fields are white under harvest right in front of us. Take your Bibles, open them to 2 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter number 4. We are uh, in a, our spring series on what it means to be a God pleaser. The book of Hebrews tells us that uh, there is no way that you can please God except by faith. And you, those who come to God must believe that He is, that He is God and He is good and He is great and He loves you. Uh, I, I heard a new word in Sunday school this morning, um, omnibenevolent. He is always benevolent. What a wonderful word. And that uh, we must come to God and believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want to be, be found when Christ comes, seeking his face, seeking to get to his feet, seeking to be faithful unto him. I want to do what God has for me to do the way that he wants me to do it for his glory. I want his will. I want to do it his way. I want it to be for his glory. Now that means that I can't do it what I think because I'm too small. I serve a great big God. I, I can't do it the way I think about it because I have a finite mind, but I know the one who has the infinite mind. We, we need to be able to not look at it for our glory, what we can get out of it. Church, it doesn't need to be not one little bit selfish, but selfish for him. His glory. I want my life to be about him. I want him to put all those things in front of me. Now, it, it, to do that, if I'm going to have to have a, if I'm going to have a God-sized vision, y'all good with that? If I'm going to walk the God-sized trail, if I'm going to accomplish what I can only accomplish with him, then I must expect it to be bigger than me. But I'm going to come in the life that I have. Y'all good with that? With the troubles that I have. A few weeks ago, we, we, we talked about we're all wounded. And the wound heals from the inside out. So often we just want to put a Band-Aid over it and, and just say, Make the, make the troubles go away. Make the hardships go away. Listen, please listen. He does that from the inside out. We've been, I've really been challenging you from some stories in God's Word that show us His nature. And, and we've been talking about some great big things that God's done. Joshua 10, sun, stand still. Joshua prayed it and the sun stopped in the sky. That's a that's a great big prayer, amen? Do you believe God can do that? If you don't, you'll never see it. And if you don't believe that God can do it in you, you won't ever see it. God gets good glory, great glory, from us trusting him. So we must trust him enough to come to him and say, God, God I, I am grateful that you have this all worked out because I don't see it. But, Lord, I'm just going to come to you with all the wounds that I have and say, God, do a great big work in all of that. Y'all good with that? If you are, stand up and read with me in God's Word. 2 Kings chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor has come to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. What a phrase, nothing. Just a jar of oil. Could you imagine a barren house somewhere up on a shelf is some olive oil. And that's all she has. Verse 3. Then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. So when you have come in, and you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Y'all good with that? Evidently she was, verse 5 says, so she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons who, who brought the vessels to her and 
she poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. He said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons live on the rest. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Now, Lord, your word promises that when, in, when we read your word, Lord, I will do my best to preach your word as you wrote it. Father, give us eyes to see the truths that you put there. Father, may we see this woman's pain, her anguish, her desperation. Lord, can we see how she had found that bitter end, that rock bottom. But Lord, I pray that when we find the end of us, we find the beginning of you. And Lord, when we find the end of our strength, we find the beginning of yours. And when we find the end of our supply, Lord, we find the endless, bountiful supply. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God who provides. I thank you, Lord, that when she found herself in want, she came to the one who could meet the need. And God, I thank you for loving us, all of us, each of us, every one of us, just like you did that widow. Father, teach us that this is not a story of yesterday. Oh, God, show us this is the story of life today. May we grasp it today. May we fall on our knees and cry out like this woman did so that, Lord, we could find your bounty because we are so desperately in need. Lord, speak to our hearts as only you can. And, sir, we will give you the glory. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. A preacher's wife. He lived his life unto the Lord. Well, I remember those years ago when I accepted the call to preach. I was 24. And I made this statement. I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, whenever, wherever, however to whoever. And that's, tried, that's kind of how I've tried to live my life. And life has occurred. Things have occurred. Things have come up. It's those things called life. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you're young, you've got the dreams, you've got the plans, you've got it all scoped out. I knew what my church was going to look like and all those things. Funny, um, all I really want is my church, our church, just to look like heaven. Heaven on earth. Wouldn't that be good? I mean, we've got a view of what heaven's supposed to be like. We, got that, we know the picture, of the, the picture of God who sits on the throne in heaven. Y'all like that? I mean, the God of love, the God who has all the economy, the God who does not understand need because he is the need maker. He is the need meter. And, and we understand that this great big God who's there, who loves us so very much, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask according to the power that works in us, and he sees us in our lives. He sees your family. He knows everything about you. And he knows that, that from time to time we're going to come to the place because God loves us, we're going to find that, that we are at a desperate place, but he's a great big God. And life happens. And, and children are born and people die. And her husband died. I know she wasn't expecting that, and I don't know how long the illness was. It could have been sudden. I don't know how old he was. But he had the same issues that we have. As a family, they had debt. Anybody in here have debt? No, 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 let me say that. Anybody here not have debt? That'd be a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? And sometimes it could really mount up. You know, have y'all ever had the, the desperate walk to the mailbox? You didn't want to go, but you had to. And, and you didn't want to go because of two things, political ads, and you hate those. Amen? God help us over the next 15, 16 months. But, but also because of those things called bills. Yeah. I mean, every now and again, you get one of those letters that says, you've just won $10 million, but you never have figured out how to get it, right? We have need, and, and, and we, it's called life, and, and we're, we're, we just have to face it. And she wasn't expecting it. She probably had dreams to hold hands with her husband the rest of their days and, 
and bounce the grandchildren. And for some of y'all, selfish people, great-grandchildren, I don't know if I'll ever get there. <laughs> Looking forward to it, maybe. I'll probably be so old that I won't even know who they are. <laughs> but in God's best, God took her husband home. And she got up to live her life, and I don't know how long it was, but she had no way of making money. The men made the money. With debt, if they did have land, they probably, in, in, the, in the way that Israel did that at that time, you would lease your land out and someone else would pay you waiting for the year of Jubilee for it to come back to you. But maybe that money was gone too. She has a debt, and the creditors will find you. You try to hide from the IRS, they'll find you. They know how to find you. And all those debts were there. Except it was a little bit different in that day. If you had a debt and you couldn't pay your debt, they would come and take what you have. Look in her house, what did she have? A jar of oil sitting on the shelf. Doesn't tell us that she had any flour, just a jar of oil. And yet, if you can't pay the debt, what they would do is they would come and take her boys, her sons, and literally sell them into slavery to pay the debt, or at least the amount of money that they could get to offset the debt. So she's lost her husband, her companion. There's no way that she can earn any money except by beggar prostitution, and that's not good options. Amen? So she goes to the, the prophet, Elisha. You, your servant, he served you, Elisha. He's gone, and the creditors have come, and they're going to take my boys away. What would she be left with then? A broken heart. Absolutely nothing, literally on the streets. Is this God's plan? Is this God's desire? The God who loves so very much, the God who from the throne in glory wants so much for his children. By the way, he wants much more for you than you do for yourself. But he doesn't want the, the, the futile. He doesn't want the fruitless. He wants the blessing. He doesn't want the vanity. He doesn't want that that just blows away. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And he looked back upon his life. And this man who had been blessed so much by God had, had, had done so much that he called vanity. It was like a breath, a vapor. You breathe it out and it's gone. A man wants to have something that outlasts him. He wants something of significance there. He wants something that matters, something that lasts, something that's meaningful and real, not which is just fluff. So she goes, and I, I love this word, it says she cried out. To look at it, it means it just uncontrollably pours out her heart. Can you see the, can you see the tears rolling down? her face. Can you hear the desperation in her voice? And as only Elisha could, actually, Jesus said this as well many times, by the way, what shall I do for you? Do you remember the story in Jesus' life when the blind men came to him? They're crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. And they come to him, and, and Jesus looks over at them, and by the way, I have, my spiritual gift is sarcasm. Amen? I, I am a spiritual smart aleck. If you didn't know that, you found it out pretty quickly, haven't you? Who is this preacher? Well, my Lord was kind of that way. At least it kind of sounded that way. These two blind men are running up to him, and he says to him, well, what do you want me to do for you? I don't think it's quite how he said it. But really, what he wanted was to have a spiritual checkup or the x-ray of where the heart was. What do you want me to do? And I wonder if he asked us this question today, especially the young people. 
You've got all your life in front of you. What do you want God to do for you? Is it just to give you the greatest health in the world on your way to eternity? If you could just not have any more aches and pains, is that really what you value most? Well, I, I, I'd really like not to have to, to, to strive anymore in life. I'd like to have uh, all my bills paid and, you know, just an easy uh, retirement. That seems to be a big thing in America today. I, I just can't wait to get to retirement. That was me when I started off. Now I understand now I'm never going to retire. I'm going to preach as long as I got power, breath, and I'm full of a lot of hot air. Amen? And then I'm going to find me some young preacher and I'm just going to wear him out. I'm just going to wear him out. I'm going to be doing what I'm doing for the rest. But so many people in America today are like, I just can't wait till I do nothing. I think some of them have already found it. They just don't know it. Do nothing. What do, you, what do you really want me to do? Heal the wound? Church, listen. Are we asking for God to take away what God allowed, allowed to happen because he looked at your life and said, amen, amen, this is best. We're just looking for an easy path through. When God may be looking for something much more significant, what do you want me to do for you? Then he asked the question, what do you have? If God is a God who's already provided, if he is Jehovah Jireh and he's already there, really we need to look at where, what is it that he's entrusted to me? What is it that I'm the steward of? What is it that's already in my hands? What is it that's already been placed before me that he's looking for me to be faithful with? Faith may not be, Lord, send me something from heaven. Faith may be, Lord, let me take what you've already given to me and put it back into your bountiful hands. What do you have? Well, honestly, she didn't have much. She said, your maidservant has nothing in the house, just a jar of oil. Come on now. I mean, not full. This is not a 55-gallon vat. She's probably got some small little container, something that she can hold in her hand, and I doubt it's even overflowing. What do y'all think? Some level of empty. I don't have a thing. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Are y'all good with that? By the way, that's more than just a scripture verse to be painted on your cheeks if you're a football player. You're going to play in the Super Bowl or something like that, and the camera goes on you, and you've got the scripture on, on your face. I, I'd rather it be in your heart than on your face. I, I'd rather it be something that you're actually living out. We are believers in Jesus Christ, amen? But are we followers of Jesus Christ? There are a lot more truths of God's word that I know that I'm not living. What if we just got to the point where we took the words of God that he's already placed within our heart and we begin to live those? What if we take the provision of what God has already given us and say, Quit finding every excuse for why God can't use us and come with what God's blessed us with and say, here am I, Lord, send me. I'm not Billy Graham. I'm never going to be Billy Graham. I have realized that. I'm just going to be Brian. And by the way, if he doesn't like me the way he made me, he messed up because he made me. I have this thing figured out. He probably made me the way he wanted for a reason and a purpose. And do you think he probably made you the same way? He gave you the family that he wanted you to have. You were born in the place that he wanted you to be born, right? In the time, on the day, in the season that he wanted you to live. He surrounded you with the people that he wanted you to influence and have. And, he, and you just take who you are. 
where you are and serve it to do his will in you, his will and his way for his glory. Quit seeing the deficit and find the God who blesses. So that's the truths of God that Elisha knew. So what he does is he challenges her. I love this. You've got nothing, just a little oil. Verse 3, go. Uh, faith always begins with G-O, go. If you're looking for faith, I shouldn't be doing this. If you're looking for faith, and you're going to say, all right, Lord, here I am. Now give me some faith. See, he's talking back to me. <laughs> Lord, do this. Lord, this needs to be done. Lord, I don't understand our, our world. I don't understand these situations. I don't understand these families. Lord, do something. You're the God of glory. I pray blessings upon the... There is a time that we need to get up and we need to understand that God's saying, you say you believe this? Well, let's put some feet to it. He goes to this woman and says, get up and go to your neighbors and borrow some vessels everywhere from all your neighbors. Get empty vessels, by the way. Do not gather just a few. Huh? Go get vessels. So you go to your neighbor. Hi. I was wondering, you got any vessels that I can borrow? Well, I might have some. No, empty vessels. I just want the ones that are empty. Can I have every empty vessel you have? What in the world are you going to do? I, it's okay. Can I borrow some vessels? She gives them to her boys, and they run them back to the house, and she goes to the next door. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm broke. Can I have some empty vessels, please? <laughs> Do you think she sounded foolish? And what about when she went all through the town, gathered every empty vessel she could, she takes them back to her house, she is setting herself up to be the biggest fool in all the world. But look what Elisha tells her to do. And when you have come in, that means back to her house, shut the door behind you and your sons. By the way, she knows this before she ever goes to the first house to gather the first empty vessel. Close the doors and take that little bitty thing of oil that you got. And begin to pour into the next vessel until it's full. And then grab another one. Now she could have looked at Elisha and said, you're an idiot. She could have looked at him and said, I thought you loved me. Don't you understand my husband was one of your servants? And you're going to ask me to do this? There's not a person in this room that thinks that what Elisha told her to do made sense outside of a miracle of a holy God. But what he was talking her to do was we need to get from your deficit to the supply. Because Elisha knew that when God sits upon the throne, he's got this pipeline. Now, in Scripture... Oil is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And I don't care what your need is, the answer is Jesus. You need more of him and less of you. That's why we must come to God as empty vessels. God does not want to fill up something that's commingled with something else. We need to be sanctified, set apart, cleansed. We need the blood of Jesus Christ to come in and cleanse us from all of our sins. Now, before I preach every message that I preach, I know that I'm saved. I, I, I know that God has forgiven me, but I say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know I'm forgiven, but I want to claim it. 
I, I, I want to profess this right then. So before I preach any and every sermon, I say, Father, forgive me of all my sins, those that I know about and those that I don't know about. And Father, cleanse me. And, and then I say, take the Holy Spirit and dip that rag into, into the blood of Jesus Christ and go in and cleanse out every dirty little area. Y'all know when y'all clean something that those little areas that get there, that, it, that this dirt just finds its place? I'll say, take the blood of Jesus Christ and just wipe them clean because I want to be 100% pure. Because you see, I know that God can only pour through me what he first pours in me. So I want to be an empty vessel that I can be filled with him. Then if I get filled with him, then there's an overflow that hopefully will splash on you. He understood the way that God works. By the way, not just for Elisha and not just for this widow, but Gary, for you, Daryl, for you. Y'all hear me? Ken, for you. He knew there was a pipeline from glory. It's connected to the throne of God, and it flows down in, with, and through us. And as this woman, by faith, grabs this oil, it begins to pour out. And you can see the glory bumps as they started to rise, as it filled up, and she said those words, another vessel? The voice. And another? May I have another? And there, can you imagine that house, tables under tables? shelves everywhere there are these empty jars and the boys just keep bringing them and what she had just keeps pouring out that almost sounds like my lord with a boy's lunch when he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it away and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it away and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it away who did he give it to he gave it to the disciples to carry to the others. And 5,000 men, as well as women and children, were fed. He didn't just give it directly to them. He poured it through those disciples. And at the end of it, each of the disciples gathered up the fragments that remained. How many disciples? Twelve. How many baskets fulls left over? They all got to walk out the abundance. Are y'all good with that? They got to carry the reminder that there's nothing too big for my God. Oh, what a need. Send them away. No, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. Lord, we can. It'd take 200 days wage to fill these people. Bring me what you have. All we got this one boy's lunch. But he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it away. And to this woman, what did she have? Just a little oil. And God blessed it. <laughs> and he broke her. And he poured through a broken vessel and filled up every vessel she had. And the oil did not stop flowing until the last vessel was filled. May God put his blessing upon New Holland Baptist Church and may the, may the bounty of the Holy Spirit, may it not stop until every empty vessel is filled. Till every family is filled. Till every need is met by the God who is the supply. Do you think they had revival in that house that day? <laughs> she runs back to the prophet. <laughs> it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. It never ceased until the need had been met. Then she came and told the man of God and said to him, go. He said, go, sell the oil, pay your debt. And you and your sons, listen to me now, y'all live on the rest. God is not able not only to meet your need, but to provide for every need. Come on now. Every need. Any need. Every need. You know why Christians don't want to do what God calls us to do? 
we're just not quite sure that God would do it in us. The greatest thing that God could do was set us just absolutely full of the Holy Spirit and just turn us loose. What could happen? Heaven could happen. Heaven could happen. People who don't know Christ could come to know Christ. Families that are broken could be brought back together. What could God do if we could empty ourselves of our, of our junk? Can I say that? If we could just get the junk out of the way and believe God to do great and mighty things, oh, what God could do. But we're going to have to be available. There needs to be some emptying in this place before there can be an infilling. If you're looking for God to heal the wound from the outside just to make the, the trouble go away, a miracle a day will keep the Satan away. My Lord prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. I said this last week. If there's any way this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. Aren't you grateful he emptied himself of his will? And he allowed the power of God to be with him on the cross. How else could he say, Father, forgive them? They don't know what they do. Under, my, under thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost and died. But we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior. And what he gave away... God gave back in abundance because God didn't just give him life, God gave me life. And he gave many of you life. Are y'all tired of living in the deficit? Preacher, are you saying that if, if I just give my heart and life to him, I'll never have a need again? You never heard me say that. But I promise you, you'll have the God who meets needs with you. Emmanuel, God with you. So would you rather have a need met or would you rather have the need meter with you? That may not be good English, but it sounded good coming out of my mouth. <laughs> we begin this by wanting to say that we wanted to be God pleasers. And that you, it's impossible to please God without faith. So church, let me ask you, real plainly, real simply, what was the last thing that you did that was by faith in God alone? It was said the last century by a great prophet of God, a great preacher of God, said that if the Holy Spirit were taken out of most churches, you'd never notice a difference. God help us. Are we living a, a life where we are desperately in need of his hand every day? Any day, in any circumstance. Sometimes I think we're trying to get ourselves together when we just need to be an old empty vessel filled with God that he can take and pour out his blessings wherever It needs to be one of those, Lord, can you begin with me, Sandra, with you, Debbie, with you, Rick, Steve, Philip, Rodis, with you, let's pray. Father, you are the need meter. You are the God who knows all and loves all. And Lord, you're the God who can supply. Lord, I pray that we can be honest. I pray, Lord, that we would be awakened to to see how much of our life we're living on our strength and how much of it we're truly depending on you. Lord, I am grateful that when I have needs, I can come and cry out before you. 
Lord, I'm grateful that you're not able just to fill one cup, but to fill every cup. Oh, God, we're going to be absolute fools without the presence of the Holy Spirit, loving and performing, bringing us to you where you can put your mighty arms of love around us. Lord, if there's anyone in this building today that does not know you as Savior, they don't have a relationship with you. They have not been forgiven. Their sin is still blocking the way. They haven't been cleansed. Father, I pray that they would, take, they would have the wisdom today to pray and to ask you to do for them what only you can do, to forgive them, to cleanse them, and make them whole. I pray, Lord, that they would just ask you, Pray a prayer like this, Lord, I believe in you. I know you're God's son. I know that you came to die for me on the cross of Calvary, to die for my sins. I know that you rose again so that I could have new life. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and save me. All my life I give to you. Lord, now I will serve you. I will be a Jesus believer. I will be a Jesus follower. Use me, Lord, to do your will and your way for your glory. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this building today that needed to pray that prayer, Lord, that they were willing and prayed that prayer from their heart to you. Lord, for those that have already prayed that prayer, I pray that, Lord, today, this day, that we will seek to live for you with all of our heart. Just come broken, empty, so that you can fill us up and use us. Pour in us what only you can pour in us, and pour through us to make us a vessel of blessing. Bless this time of the invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're here and you do not know Jesus, or if you just prayed to accept Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold. Come down here and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, either I need to be saved or I just prayed to receive Christ. Let me rejoice with you. Let me help you to, to, to start this new Christian life. If you're a Christian here today and you, you say, I, I've lived long enough in brokenness. I want God to fill me. Then whatever it is God's asking you to do, start there. Start there. If you need to be a member of our church, you come, and I'll show you the way that you can become a member of our church. Very simple, but it's a step of obedience. If you've been saved and you haven't been baptized, first step of obedience. First step. Here I am, Lord. I want to publicly profess that you are mine and I am yours. I'm immersed in you. Whatever it is God's asking you to do, let's do it today for his glory. Amen. Stand with us as we sing.